Uh, we're pleased to welcome back Gary to the Wings Club. Um, Gary serves as Chairman of the Board, President and CEO of Southwest Airlines, but of course you all know that already. Uh, under his leadership, Southwest has grown to become the nation's largest airline, expressed in terms of number of passengers carried. They have also set a number of other impressive records. They're celebrating 41 consecutive years of profitability. They've never had one single furlough during the airline's 43-year history and they're consistently on Fortune magazine's list of most admired companies in the world. But you all know that already. Um, for those who have not been following the stock, Southwest Airlines stock this year has risen second only to Hawaiian Airlines. Uh, that's no advertisement for Hawaiian, it's meant as a compliment to Southwest. Southwest has beaten every other airline except Hawaiian in terms of stock price increase this year. And right now today, Southwest Airlines has the third highest airline capitalization of any airline in the global business. It's pretty impressive. Gary personally has received numerous uh, awards and recognitions. Most notably, he was named one of the best CEOs in America by Institutional Investor Magazine, not once, not twice, but three times. Gary was inducted into the McCombs School of Business Hall of Fame at the U University of Texas in Austin and he has just completed his term as Chairman of Airlines for America. Gary, please join me on the stage here in your chair. Thank you. So for today's uh, interview session, we're very pleased to welcome David Johnson to us, with us. Uh, David has been a radio and television business analyst on local and national media since 1975. Sorry, David, it's a, it's a long time. I didn't want to tell him how old you are. Um, he hosted his own television program, Business Edition with David Johnson, on KERA in Dallas, and was the business analyst for WFFA TV, FAA TV, correct myself, WFAA TV for 21 years. Currently, David is the business analyst at CBS affiliate KRLD. That was in a song, wasn't it? Um, his Wall Street update and the Wall Street wrap-up can be heard twice daily on the Texas State Network station. So, David, please join us on the stage here. It's a great time to be having Gary and David with us today. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. You're about to wrap up the AirTran merger, and I guess the AirTran name goes away, what, the end of this month? 28th. <clears throat> so how'd that go? I mean, it, the AirTran merger is, is done? The integration? Everything? everything? So we, we closed on uh, that deal in uh, May the 2nd of 2011, Yeah. and the first couple of years were uh, really focused on continuing to run a good airline uh, at AirTran, and I just want to thank all of our AirTran uh, family members. They've done a phenomenal job and uh, really put us in a very superb position to uh, complete the merger, and they've been through a lot of change, so I'm very, very proud of them and very thankful uh, for their hard work. Uh, the first couple of years are really preparing Southwest to do different things that AirTran brought us, international, uh, and a different aircraft than the 737. And both of those um, major initiatives are, are essentially being completed this year so that we can complete the merger. So December 28th will be the last flight of AirTran, so the AirTran brand will be retired that night. Uh, that simply means that on December the 29th, every single flight that takes off will be a Southwest flight. So the work that remains, David, is obviously there are AirTran airplanes that are flying right up to that deadline and those airplanes will uh, be put on the ground and go through conversion into either the Southwest livery or to go out of Southwest Airlines fleet. So we'll have 34 717s uh, that will stop flying on that day and we'll work next year to finish up the conversion. These are the ones that didn't go to Delta, right? Those are all going to Delta, correct. Okay. And all the 737s, of course, are coming into Southwest. I believe we'll have 18 737s uh, that will go through conversion early next year and be flying in Southwest uh, early next year. So the, um, w w and one of the things that brought you, of course, is it made you an international carrier. Yes. Um, so is that integration working well, would you say? <laughs> oh, it's worked out superb. And 
What is interesting about the way that we've done the merger, which I think is different than what other airlines have done, is we didn't do a hard cutover. Uh, we simply started drawing down AirTran flights and pulling them up as Southwest, and that was done gradually over a two to three year time period. Uh, and, the air, and the international flights uh, fit that profile. So AirTran was flying international up until this year. We gradually moved those flights into Southwest once Southwest launched international capabilities in two steps in January and in July. And at this point in time, all international flights are being flown by Southwest Airlines. So we have seven international destinations uh, plus uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, which are different uh, flying uh, operationally uh, and commercially than uh, our 48 state flying. And it's all gone extraordinarily well. Historically, what you've done is you've connected dots rather than hub and spoke. You just... Yes. And I don't know, did you run out of dots to connect? Have you run it? You know, in the, in the 48 states, uh, if you go back to uh, pre-AirTran, yes. I think that we were at a point in time where in 2010, we didn't have a lot of dots that we could add. Uh, and our leadership team agreed at that point that it was time for us to invest uh, in growing the airline by acquisition uh, and increasing our capabilities. Uh, so at this point in time, we've got 50 potential destinations that we can add to our route map. Um, and we've never had a point in time in our history where we had that many. Wait, uh, new destinations or connecting? 50, 50 new dots to the route map. So we've served 93 destinations today. Uh, and there are 50 potential more that can be added. And virtually all of those are outside the 48 states. And I have some news to share this morning. Would you like me to do that now? Like, are we, are we going to make news right now? We're going to make news right now. All right. So we're announcing today that we're filing with the uh, Department of Transportation to serve uh, six more cities from Houston's uh, international operation, which we expect to open up in the fall of next year. Uh, so we are applying to serve Cancun, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico City, um, Cabo San Lucas, and um, San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, so that's new news today. Uh, in addition, uh, we are announcing that we will add another destination to the route map, uh, which is Belize City, Belize. And that will also be uh, served uh, from Houston. And those six destinations uh, are in addition to serving Aruba from Houston, uh, which uh, starts up uh, next March. So uh, big news, and that will be our third new city for 2015. San Jose, Costa Rica is one, Puerto Vallarta is number two, and now Belize will be number three. Uh, and we have a fourth new city, but we will uh, announce that uh, uh, next year. So, so go back. So you, you're, you're building the new international terminal at Houston. Yes. And that opens when? In October? That opens. It is scheduled to open in the fourth quarter, and we don't have a firm date yet, but hopefully uh, But so those routes will start then. Right. So w what's the nature of those routes? Are they, uh, is there any business travel at all, at all, or is it all vacation travel? You know, what we're doing right now with our international flights is we're looking at cities that are, uh, the demand is heavily oriented towards the United States customer. Uh, so in this particular case, it's mostly people that are US citizens traveling for uh, leisure. And uh, that'll be a good start for us and our focus right now is on Latin America. So and international for us today is very small. It's about one to one and a half percent of our total route system. Uh, and that will grow, but it'll grow very gradually over time. Are you in the vacation package business? Uh, yeah, we, we definitely have vacation and so packages. That'll, be, that'll grow? Yeah, and, and just the fact, of course, that we are America's leading low fare airline. Uh, that's people that are on vacation. They're spending their own money. They're looking for great value, and they're looking to have a good time. We're the ones to fly. This low fare airline, now this is intriguing because one of the things you also did, of course, one of the many things you did this year, is the, the right amendment was repealed, and your home base, Love Field, was opened up, and you added, what, 18 new nonstop destinations? Out of we added uh, seven and then an additional, uh, we added nine and then additional seven uh, nonstop destinations. So, We've got a couple more coming in January. So 16. Now, um, another airline spirit came out, I guess it was this week earlier, and said, this fair competition that you and American have going out of, out of the North Texas market, I guess, DFW and Ella Field, is depressing prices, and it's hurting other airlines. It's hurting Spirit. 
Um, it almost sounds like the old Southwest. Well, it, it's all mysterious to me. We've only been planning this launch of flights for eight years, so uh, <laughs> there's, I don't think, any surprise, at least to me, Mike, that we've added flights uh, at uh, Love Field. So. Uh, we're spending over a half a billion dollars to build a brand new terminal. So yeah, I think that we ought to be adding some flights there and lowering some prices. And apparently it's working because of all the new flights that we've added, the average load factor is about 90%. So I'm very happy with how that's working. And uh, our Tammy Romo, our CFO, just announced our November results and our unit revenues are up four to five percent. So we're, we're feeling good. You know, the, the old days, airline had 90% load factor. They got scared because you were leaving people on the ground and you were filling up Virgin or somebody else. Um, is that kind of, can you sustain that? Or? Well, you know, it's, it, it, as you know, Love Field is limited to 20 gates under federal law. So there's only so much capacity there. And it, it's very clear to us at this point in time that the demand exceeds the capacity. So, yeah, I expect that we're going to continue to run very full flights. But you've, You've changed the, the equipment, and so you're, you've increased your capacity without really, I guess, net increasing the airplanes. Where are you in that transition? We've, we've increased the gauge uh, of the airline, so I think our average seating uh, per departure today is about 144, and that's primarily uh, derived by uh, adding uh, a row of seats to our 700 aircraft. Uh, so you get six more seats with the new thin line uh, seats, very comfortable. And then uh, the 737-800 uh, has uh, 32 more seats than that. So that's how we're up-gauging the departures. And um, I think we'll end this year with 78-800s. Uh, all the airplanes that we are delivering new from Boeing are 800s. Uh, it's Fantastic airplane. Uh, the average load factor of that subfleet is the highest in our system, and uh, it's it's been performing very very well. And, and the deliveries continue, but right. you, but you're getting back essentially the same aircraft. I mean, you're, the seats are thinner. You have greater capacity, but uh, the only uh, I mean the the other thing we've seen over the last couple of weeks is is airlines announcing amenities. They're back again. Uh, Americans said they were going to spend $2 billion. Delta's talking about this. Obviously, the international carriers are doing this, even, even adding amenities to, you know, to, to coach. And you still pretty much have the same product. Can you keep this up? Well, we've made, you know, I think whether it's at home or whether it's at the office or whether it's with a business, uh, there are upgrades that are, that are cyclical. And I think that, uh, at least for some airlines, this is a cycle. We've We've done some very nice upgrades at Southwest over the past five to six years. Um, we have all coach seating. There is uh, at no second class on Southwest Airlines. We've upgraded no our frequent out. flyer program. Uh, so there's a long list of things that we have uh, done to invest for the customer. And, um, and, and we'll continue to do that. But uh, I'm not looking for any major changes to our customer experience, uh, certainly uh, in 2015. I mean, even Ryan, I think Ryan, which is knockoff of Southwest, announced they were going to add, you know, more leg room. And I, and I think of the foray in, you know, into the Southeast and taking AirTran and filling that part of the puzzle all at once is it gave you this great lower 48 presence. So you could be more of a business airline. But I thought along with, you know, getting that corporate travel, you had to have you know, maybe a club here or there? Well, it, you, our people really are the difference at Southwest. We offer a great product. We focus on on-time performance. If you go back to the beginning of the DOT uh, keeping statistics, we're number one. Uh, our folks do a great job of handling bags. And, uh, and what most people want is to get there on time, get where they're going, where they want to go, rather, and get there with their bag and, and not spend a lot of money doing that. So. Uh, our people do a great job of being very friendly and um, welcoming our customers on board as if they're guests in their home. So uh, I think that's what really differentiates Southwest. You can throw all the gadgets that you want in the world, but that won't overcome lousy personal service. And that's, uh, that's something that uh, we're very, I'm very proud of. I'm very proud of our people. 
Uh, and year in, year out, our brand rankings and customer service rankings are always at the top, and I'm, I'm just very proud of them. And they always have been. And, and, but it seemed like over the last year, year and a half, two years, as you were incorporating AirTran and expanding and getting with the new fleet, um, the on-time performance started slipping. I, I noticed, the, I guess the numbers came out yesterday, and, and you had come back up some in October, but there's still nothing like they used to be. And, and, you know, bags fly free, but, but to where? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> to where you're going, David. <laughs> oh, the same place. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't think there's any question that there's stresses and strains um, every single year. Our on-time performance was not where it needed to be. But the uh, October was 80%. Yeah. If you look uh, year in, year out, our average is about 82% over time. And that's what we are predicting for 2015. It will be somewhere in that 83% uh, range. I think there's always opportunities to improve. The schedule is a little bit too tight. We've made the changes that we need to make, and I'd say that it's fixed. You're flying into areas that you never used to fly into. I mean, admittedly, you've been doing this for several years now, but, you know, areas where they had some really rotten weather. Is that part of it? You mean like Houston? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, where it's so heavy they can't take off. Well, weather's just a part of our industry. And, you know, what's happened along the way here is for the last 10 years, we've been the largest airline in the United States in terms of the number of customers uh, that we serve. Um, <coughs> and how do you serve a customer? Well, number one is you need to offer a destination that they want to go to. Uh, New York is the number one travel destination in the United States, so it's, it's kind of hard to serve our customers around the country if we don't have that really critical need for them. And, um, you know, weather's going to be a factor, uh, whether it's fog in San Francisco or whether it's uh, snow in Minneapolis. But uh, it's, it's important to our customers. There's a lot of people that live there that want to fly out. There's a lot of people that we serve in other places that want to fly to those locations. And, and, and you are the largest carrier uh, yes. uh, within the U.S. But it, you, you're still sort of a secret. I mean, I watched a couple of weeks ago, there was some really rotten weather. And I don't know, I, I saw a network, you know, cast of it. And they were saying, but the three majors are allowing free exchanges. And if you, you know, if you want to, if you're going into an area where there's bad weather, you can uh, change to another flight and there's no penalty and this and that. And they were not including Southwest in that three. Because we do that as part of our package, and, and, uh, it's a low and, that, key. and that won't change. Yeah, but it's still pretty low key. So tell me about, the, let's talk about the industry right now, because this has been, you know, as an outsider reporting on the industry, post deregulation, uh, people would ask me about the airline industry, I said, it's, it's suicidal. <laughs> Every time things get good, they start cutting prices, they have fare wars, you have a lot of new entrants that come in, and then they screw it all up, and then <laughs> cycle starts again, and they go back down. Is this, I don't know how to ask it, is the industry sort of right-sized now? You look at the uh, post-recession period, uh, where by then every major airline that existed a generation ago was either gone or gone bankrupt yeah. and restructured. So you have a brand new industry for all practical purposes. Um, the, the supply and demand equation was very well matched. And uh, the, the industry was also adjusting as rapidly as possible to much higher energy cost. Uh, so that was a disciplining factor on the industry also. Uh, what happens from here is anybody's guess. And um, I think that it's a very, very competitive industry. Uh, you have some airlines that are growing very rapidly. And um, it just remains to be seen uh, who will be the winners and losers going forward. But competition yeah. is what... America's built on, and uh, we're all for it at Southwest Airlines. But are there barriers to entry up now? I mean, it, it, like I said, when, it, when, well, when times got good, it seemed like some bank would have a bunch of, you know, MD-80s parked in Arizona. No, I, they'd go to somebody and say, let's start up an airline. No, I, you can get airplanes, you can hire people, you can get money. And um, there's, uh, I think, it's, we all, we've always laughed that there are no barriers to entry, but there are a lot of barriers to exit. Uh, but uh, no, I think it will continue to be a very hyper-competitive industry. I think cost and service will continue to be the two key factors uh, on a head-to-head -head competition, and we want to be the best uh, at both of those. We want to be the low-cost producer, and we want to offer the greatest service. The new equipment has helped, it seems like, everybody a lot. 
Yes. I mean, this, you know, this, this round of airplanes that are coming out right now, um, is this it for a while? I mean, are, are the improvements in place that you need? Well, n no, I think we're on the cusp of uh, a wave of new technology that's about to be introduced by both Boeing uh, and Airbus, and uh, it's all driven by new engine technology for the first time really in a generation. So that is something that we're very much looking forward to. We're the launch customer for the MAX, the Boeing uh, 737 MAX, which comes in 2017, and uh, the progress thus far has been superb and it looks like uh, it will live up to everything that we had hoped. So uh, we're looking for double-digit reductions in fuel burn, uh, which is obviously very climate friendly as well. So those are very nice advances. Where we go from here, I think uh, the industry is continuing to uh, do, do research as to what the next step is. But it feels like that's going to be a ways down the road. Energy prices are the, you know, the, the, the great variable and did every, you know, everybody when you know, the Arab oil embargo is going, going back to that point. Now we've got energy prices coming back down again. Um, I mean, you're the energy czar. I mean, you're, <laughs> the, reason, the reason Southwest Airlines has made money through all of those years was uh, in the lean years is you were hedging. You as CFO structured, you know, the hedging operation. So you and Tammy, put your CFO hats on right now. What do you do now? Are these prices going to stay around for a while? Hell if I know what we do now. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, and, and that is actually the honest answer. I, I don't think we have ever, uh, ever anointed ourselves the czars or the seers of what's going to happen in the future. It's impossible to do that. As, you, as we sit here today, I think the future is largely dependent upon what people decide to do, and that actually becomes what nations decide to do. So um, uh, that will have a very large impact on pricing. As, as you know your history, where we, we've had prices collapse in the past, OPEC would band together, cut production, and prices would soar. Prices were at a generational low in the late 1990s, which set the stage for a tear in terms of increasing uh, energy prices for the next decade. So we're very mindful of that, and hedging is not intended to be a money maker. It is like having insurance on your home. Nobody is hoping that the house burns down because I've got insurance <laughs> and I point. want it to pay off. Uh, so our, our hedging program is designed to prevent a catastrophe financially, which it has served its purpose well over 25 years. And uh, there is a cost associated with that insurance program. And when prices go down, our bias is that direction. Today, uh, we're participating with our hedging program on uh, about 80% of, of a dollar by dollar decline uh, in energy prices. So there's a cost associated with it. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, our fuel bill all in hedged is down dramatically. Uh, and uh, in the fourth quarter, uh, our fuel prices will be lower than a year ago. For next year, we're looking at uh, on sort of a, a benchmark $3 a gallon uh, jet fuel in 2014, maybe $2.95 a gallon. Uh, next year, we're looking at $2.30, $2.40 a gallon. Wow. So it is a gigantic decline uh, in fuel So $2.30 a gallon with a still more fuel efficient fleet. Correct. You're going to be printing money. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, if all else is equal. <laughs> And, uh, as we both know, uh, it's never a straight line up in this industry. But, no, but uh, Iana. That's a very good outlook, I agree. <laughs> Iana came out yesterday or the day before yesterday with some projections. I tried to write them all down, I, I forgot to, but they said airline profits would be up 10.6%. Uh, they had earlier said 10.6% year over year. Now they're raising that. Now they're saying next year that uh, profits are going to be up 26%. What they also said. This is a fact that really got me. That kind of probably got you excited. Consumers can expect to see a 5.1% decline in airfares next year, and cargo shippers should pay 5.8% less. Is this the real world? <laughs> well, that's, uh, you know, those are bold predictions, right? And, um, but that's all they are. They're just uh, somebody's guess as to what will happen. I think that the fundamental question to answer for somebody who's trying to plan 
uh, and Southwest Airlines is where are fuel prices going to be? Five months ago, we were over $100 a barrel. Yeah. Here we are at $60 a barrel. What's it going to be five months from now? Nobody here knows. And so all we can do is the best we can to uh, plan accordingly. It, um, my hope is that we don't see a sharp rise uh, in energy prices. My hope is that we see this as a stimulus to worldwide economies and uh, it helps to boost air travel. At the same time, we've got lower operating cost. Future pricing, of course, I can't comment on and, uh, uh, and, and don't uh, comment on. But uh, with these oil prices, if, they're, if they continue, what I can tell everybody is that our operating costs will be lower than we thought and lower certainly than uh, the, the last couple of years. And that's good for everybody. And do you sandbag for the, for the bad times? Well, it's, we always try to be prepared in good times for bad times. They have always come, yeah. and they come sometimes without, uh, without warning. So um, I, quite frankly, was taken by surprise at the collapse in oil prices. I'm more than happy to admit that. Uh, and uh, it's gone, gone down fast, and it's gone down a lot. So it just, logic tells you that the opposite can also happen, and we certainly need to be prepared for that. The, um, the other aspect of, of your industry, and you in particular making a lot of money now, is that labor can look at it and say, ah, we've been bargaining from weakness forever. Now maybe we bargain from strength. These guys have something to share. And I was looking at the list the other day, I, I guess you settled, you got some things worked out with the IAM. Yes. But you still got, if, if my list is right, pilots, flight attendants, ramp workers, stock clerks, mechanics, and facilities maintenance technicians, all of whom are, I guess, watching your earnings. <laughs> How are negotiations going? Well, first of all, one of the, the, one of the best things that we can do for our people is to be financially stable and financially successful. And then we can follow through with, with commitments that we have made. And our, our people, by and large, are the best paid in the industry, uh, one of the best health care programs in the entire country, uh, and profit sharing for them, which is retirement, uh, will be up 60% this year, 50% this year. We don't have final numbers yet, of course, but just a uh, when the company does well, our people do well. Uh, we have uh, two fundamental objectives, which is in addition to job security for our people and offering great service, we want to be the low cost producer so we can support this famous low fare brand that we have. And we've got, uh, we've got challenges on that front. We have new competition. We've got new airlines that have emerged through bankruptcy. They're more cost competitive. Uh, and that's what we're talking about, and that's the right kind of conversations to have. So I'm very glad that we've gotten three contracts done in 2014. Uh, we've got six to go, and uh, I'm very anxious to get those in place so that our employees can share in all the great things that are going on at Southwest Airlines. All right. We're going to get some questions for the audience in just a second. We might get the mics ready, and Mr. Muldudis will get the first one. Uh, but I'll ask you the one thing fr from 2000. 14, I mean, like I say, you guys did so much, but you've got the little heart on your lapel. Um, the new paint scheme, the, I call it a branding, and you guys always correct me. Uh, what, what is it? What was the, what it's was a, the It's a brand scene? update. It's, it's uh, and we had some work to do from a marketing perspective to clean up some logos and clean up some uh, airport signage, and uh, as per usual, you'd like to do that in whatever updated scheme that you, right. you have in mind. We stuck with our colors. Uh, I think that they turned out magnificent. Uh, and we also arrived at a new logo, which, uh, which I also think uh, has been a, a grand slam home run. I'll have people uh, stop me in a grocery store and say, oh, you work for Southwest. And it's not because they recognize me. And this logo has been out for not even three months. So that's a pretty good match. And um, we wanted to commemorate this year. 2014 is such a monumental year for Southwest Airlines uh, that we wanted to celebrate in that way. It's outstanding. Um, I know they have to cut over the audio. Questions from the audience? Who, right here? Dr. J. Mr. Chairman, 
As you probably very well know, I have been a great skeptic of airline mergers. Could you bring us up to date where you stand and what the results have been with the AirTran acquisition? Thank you. Yes, sir. It would be my pleasure, and it is an honor to have you here, and it is great to see you, uh, Julia, so uh, I'm glad you're doing well. Uh, I, I think it's been a tremendous success for us. First of all, one of our goals was to increase our 48 state presence. Uh, so geographically, AirTran brought us a major presence in Atlanta, which I'm very excited about. And for the first time, we're serving uh, Washington uh, Reagan Airport. And we also have, um, uh, obviously, our, our, our toe in the water in the international markets. Uh, it boosted our presence in Orlando, in Baltimore, in Milwaukee. Um, so from that perspective, um, it, it's, it's served us very well. About a 25% increase in capacity overnight. It's brought us uh, roughly 18 new cities in a very compressed time period. Um, and from a financial standpoint, uh, you would not have the number one performer on the S&P 500 this year without AirTran. AirTran was doing about 200 million a year pre-tax when we acquired them. Uh, and through the synergies that we've been able to work through, it's doing about 600 million or, or 400 million in, in synergies, um, which is exactly what we had planned for and it's exactly what it's produced. So, and again, I just have to compliment the AirTran people because they work very hard. They're, they're, they're very much looking forward to our uh, joined uh, future together. And we're a much stronger airline uh, merged uh, than we were uh, in 2010. So it's been a grand slam home run success. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you, David. Thanks. You're a great friend. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you, David. Another stunning performance, as always. We really appreciate it.